So one of the best things about being an ancient historian is the process of discovery. Uh, and so I wanted to take you guys on a bit of a tour um, related to some of the work that I was doing recently. So I've been working, as I'm sure I've said a number of times, on a, a history of Rome from the beginning to the end. Um, so we start in the 8th century BC, we end uh, with the fall of Constantinople, and we cover everything in between. So for, I think, most Roman historians, that's a huge amount of time that takes us beyond our comfort our comfort zones, um, and that's definitely true for me as well. So um, recently, like a couple of days ago, I was working on a chapter where we're looking at what happens in the city of Rome in the 8th century AD uh, and how it falls out of the control of Constantinople, eventually becomes independent, and then finds itself folded into the uh, Carolingian kingdom of Charlemagne. And I just started asking a question. I mean, what do we know about what the city of Rome looks like in 800 AD? when Charlemagne comes into the city. And I really didn't ever think about this question before. Um, and I never had done any work on it before. And so I started picking around, um, just reading a little bit about what we know about the city and what kinds of materials we might have. I didn't expect to find very much. Um, one of the secrets of the eighth and ninth centuries, there's not a lot of material that was written in either the East or the West that survives until right now. So I didn't expect to actually have a sense of what we know um, the city of Rome was like in 800, but I really wanted to know. And this is because in 800, uh, at Christmas on um, 800 AD, we have the crowning of Charlemagne as Holy Roman Emperor by Pope Leo. Uh, and this, so this is a big event, and we know that Charlemagne had been to Rome before. We know in 800, Charlemagne goes again. It's a big ceremonial occasion. And we also know a lot of people went with him. So this, I think, offers an interesting opportunity. What do we know about the people who went with him? Well, I mean, in short, we don't know a ton, except that one of them apparently um, put together a set of walking tours that one could take in the city of Rome. And so this is somebody we imagine went with Charlemagne because uh, this document called the, called the Einseldon Itinerary um, is something that largely talks about the city of Rome, but it also talks a little bit about the city of Pavia. And Pavia is uh, a city that Charlemagne had conquered from the Lombards, and it was the um, conquest of Pavia and the conquest of the Lombard kingdom that made it possible really for Charlemagne to unite the Frankish kingdom north of the Alps with the uh, papal regime that had been set up in the city of Rome after Rome had declared its independence from the Byzantine Empire, the, the Eastern Roman Empire um, in the middle part of the 8th century. So this document actually is really cool because it, it gives us the, the account of somebody who actually was a tourist in the city of Rome at roughly the time that Charlemagne was crowned. And so he actually can tell us what more or less the city of Rome was like in the year 800. So um, this document is part of a manuscript that comes from a monastery in Switzerland. Uh, and if we look at the contents of this manuscript, we see it has a whole bunch of stuff in it. Um, Stuff about like how to abbreviate things, um, stuff about the the acts of um, Jesus, things connected to the reign of Tiberius. What are we actually interested in this document? Well, there's a couple of things. Um, the first thing that we're interested in is uh, the material that this author proposed or put together that was a collection of inscriptions that he found while he was walking around the city of Rome. And so this is, you see this number four, this is highlighted, Inscriptiones Urbis Romae. This is the, the stuff like that he saw inscribed or written on monuments across the city. And then this is followed by something that is in some ways like equally cool or even more cool. This is a set of walking tours that he laid out for people um, that might visit the city of Rome. And there are 11 of these. So um, what we have put together here is the accounts of somebody who visited the city of Rome and took a bunch of like walking tours around the city, wrote down the inscriptions that he saw on public buildings, and then listed the material that someone might see if they were to take one of these walking tours at a, a, you know, a point um, later in time when they visited the city. So let's look at both of these things together because it does help us now understand what the city would have been like when Charlemagne was crowned in 800. So let's first consider the inscriptions. Um, there's over 80 different inscriptions in this manuscript. Uh, most of them are from the city of Rome, some are from Pavia. 
Um, of these 80, it's interesting because over half of those 80 inscriptions are now lost. And many of those that are now lost were already lost by the Renaissance. And so what we have here is a set of records of public inscriptions, most of which are gone, or many of which are gone, and we wouldn't otherwise know about at all, except for the fact that this person um, wrote them down in 800. So how reliable is this? We can't check his work, right? There's 80 inscriptions here. We have like 40 of them now. So, um, so let's check and see how good um, he did and, and how much we can trust what he's showing us. So one of the first things we can do is, is look at some of these inscriptions that we still have. So one of the inscriptions that he records comes from the Ark of Constantine. Um, so, you know, the big picture you see here is the Ark of Constantine. It's um, midway between the Colosseum and the Roman Forum. Um, on the upper left, you can see it, the inscription that we still have looking at the Ark of Constantine, Imperator, Kaiser, etc. cetera. Um, and then below that, you can see from this manuscript, from the, uh, you know, the ninth century account of what he saw, we see this too reads. So above it, it says the In Arcu Constantini, that means in the Arch of Constantine, I-M-P-C-A-E-F-F-L, Constantino Maximo, PF. So you look at the first line of the inscription that he records, you look at the first line of the inscription that's still on the monument, and what you see is both of them read I-M-P-C-A-E-S-F-L-C-O-N-S-T-A-N-T-I-N-O-M-A-X-I-M-O. So this checks out, right? What he shows us here actually does work. He, he actually got it right. So um, what about things where we sort of can check his work? Well, so this is, I think, a really interesting one. So we know when he goes into the Roman Forum at the foot of the Capitoline Hill, he records three inscriptions. So you can see um, at the top of that slide, you can see that it says in Capitolio. This is um, you know, at the foot of the Capitoline Hill. And he has a set of inscriptions here, has three inscriptions that relate to the three temples um, that were once very much at the foot of the Capitoline Hill, the Temple of Saturn, the Temple of the Divine Vespasian, and the Temple of Concord. Now, if you look at the bottom left of this slide, what you can see are the remain what remains of those three temples. Uh, you can see that the front of the Temple of Saturn, that's the temple that is, you know, in the center left, um, you can see that you have basically the um, front of the temple, although the rest of it is gone. For the Temple of Vespasian, you have just the corner of it. And for the Temple of Concord, that um, pediment that has absolutely nothing on it, well, that's the Temple of Concord. So uh, what our guy has in um, 800 is he has three inscriptions. Uh, so he has one that says, Senatus Populus Que Romanorum Incendio um, Consumptue uh, Restitutit. Well, if we look at the front of the Temple of Saturn, what we see is that inscription is there. So um, the middle left, you see the inscription on the Temple of Saturn, Senatus Populus Que Romanos, Incendio Consumptum, consumptum Restuturit. This is it. This is the same thing that he says. So what about the others? Well, for the Temple of Vespasian, we have only the corner. We can see that it says, um, Estituter. Well, okay, so we don't really have the whole thing, but if we look at the second inscription that he has, um, we see he has the full inscription for the Temple of Vespasian. He has written down Vivo Vespasiano Augusto SPQR IMPP Cais um, Severos, uh, and then the inscription ends with um, restituter. Uh, and so we have there the piece that is left of um, this inscription. It's still there. Now, the final one um, is a inscription that relates to the reconstruction of the Temple of Concord. Now, you can see on the, uh, the right in the center, there is no Temple of Concord anymore. That inscription is completely gone. And so um, what we have in this record of the ninth century inscriptions is we have one um, that fully checks out with an inscription that we still have on the Temple of Saturn, one um, that is largely uh, preserving a lost inscription of which we have only the last word, 
and then one that entirely gives us a lost inscription from the Temple of Concord um, that we wouldn't have at all. So, um, so what we can see basically is it seems like not only does he check out when we actually have the inscriptions, but he also allows us to fill out or reconstruct some inscriptions that we've lost, either partially or entirely. And so this gets us to the last inscription. Um, this is an inscription. Well, so this is a last example, right? This is an example of an inscription that's completely lost. And this is an, an inscription on a triumphal arch dedicated um, by the Emperor Theodosius I and Aureus and Arcadius around the year 400. So this is at this point when he's writing this down about 400 years old. We have here, it says, um, in Arcu, in this Romae, so an arch in, in the city of Rome, more or less. Uh, and we don't have it. It's completely gone. But this would be, and this was actually what was written on that arch. So what we have is a set of um, materials, some of which are extremely useful for us because otherwise we would have no idea what was said on these monuments. So what about the itineraries? So the inscriptions seem to check out as something that we can use. What about the itineraries? So the itineraries are really interesting because they show us a city in transition. Um, the, the itineraries all start with a particular gate. Uh, and so the gate that you start from is written in red. And then what he does is he lists a set of things that you see in order as you progress into the city from that particular gate. And so he lists them in some cases, um, so not itinerary one, but in some cases, he'll even list like on what side of the street you're going to see the monument that you're looking at. So the itineraries um, start from one gate in the city wall and they lead more or less to another. And what we see here, is the ancient monuments are still there. He still knows where they are. He still knows um, that they are ancient monuments, but they seem to be abandoned. In many cases, they aren't labeled. They aren't open. Um, and their identity is not always remembered. But the Christian monuments seem to be intact. And what's interesting is a lot of these ancient monuments are either completely gone or are largely gone now. But many of the Christian monuments are not only intact, but they're in such good shape that the decorations that he saw when he visited them in 800 are still decorations that we can see now. So uh, to show why this is so interesting, I just thought we could walk through the city of Rome and follow one of his itineraries. Um, and so this is the first itinerary in, in the text, and it's one that I think is particularly interesting because it shows that the traveler knew Christian sites by their proper names, and he recognized ancient Roman sites as he went by them. But in many cases, he didn't actually know what he was seeing. He was basically guessing about what some of these ancient sites were, or he had asked somebody and that person didn't know and gave him wrong information. So if you want to take this trip, it actually would be a kind of a fun trip to take. If you actually are visiting the city of Rome, you can follow his itinerary from 800 AD, and you can see a lot of the same stuff that he was seeing. Um, it doesn't look the same, but you can see a lot of it. Uh, and so if you're interested in doing this, here's his itinerary, and here it is mapped uh, by Google Maps on um, you know, a modern sort of layout, satellite view of the city of Rome. So, um, so to just give you a sense of where he visits, so he starts basically at the uh, gate that's, that you enter the city from um, if you're crossing the Tiber at the Castle San Angelo. What was, uh, the, what was the mausoleum of Hadrian in antiquity? And then he says, you go by the Circus Flaminius, you go by the Rotunda, you go by the Baths of Commodus, you go by the Forum of Trajan and the Column of Trajan, you go through an Ark of Tiberius, you can see the Church of St. Hadrian, you can see the Church of St. Kyriakis, uh, you can see the Church of Agathis, in which there is a beautiful picture of Paul and Mary. You then will pass through the Baths of Constantine. Uh, you will visit the Church of San Vitellis, um, which is in a neighborhood um, called the Longo. Uh, it's actually now in the Monte. Um, and then you will visit the Church of St. Euphemia in the neighborhood of the Patricius, the Patricius neighborhood. So, you know, so this gives you a sense if you want to actually take this walk, um, it's actually a wonderful walk, and it takes you through a lot of the, the most impressive parts of um, the Roman Forum in ancient Rome, uh, and it will take you a little less than two hours to do it, walking sort of um, 
calmly and pleasantly through the city of Rome. So, so if you were actually standing there and you were to actually look across the Tiber, the view in 800 wouldn't be wildly different from the view that you see now. There'd of course be no electric lights on that bridge um, and those statues wouldn't be there, but that bridge is actually an ancient bridge. And so in 800 AD, if you're standing where his walk began and you look across the Tiber at the Castle San Angelo, this is more or less what it would look like then, just as it looks like now. But one thing that is very different is um, the city of Rome that he is entering into is a walled city. Uh, the Aurelian walls that you see now, I mean, if you're getting a taxi, say, from the airport, um, there's a special rate to take a uh, taxi to somewhere within the Aurelian walls. The Aurelian walls are still very real in the city of Rome, uh, but the Aurelian walls were built in the 270s. And this is before the, the Vatican became actually an important place. The Vatican in the 270s was more or less empty space that belonged to the emperor. It isn't until the reign of Constantine in the 320s um, that the Vatican really becomes something that's important. And so when the city of Rome was walled, the uh, western wall of the city of Rome went along the Tiber in this part of the city. Um, and so when you are crossing from the mausoleum of Hadrian into the city of Rome, um, there's a couple of gates you might go into. One of them is the Porta St. Pietra, and it has that name. Um, it gets that name around the year 400 when efforts are made to uh, kind of use the mausoleum of Hadrian, what's now the Castle San Angelo, to fortify the area around the Vatican. And so this is um, the, Porta de, the Porta San Pietro because it's the gate you would use when you are leaving the city of Rome and leaving the Aurelian walls and crossing over into the Vatican so you can go to St. Peter's. Um, and so you see at the very sort of, uh, you see that little pink square uh, above the Tiber River on the west bank of the Tiber. That's the Castle San Angelo. You see the Pons Aelius, uh, you cross that and you are at where our walk begins. Um, and again, in a modern context, you do exactly the same thing. The Aurelian walls are no longer along the Tiber there, but you can enter into the city at exactly the same kind of intersection that our traveler in 800 would have entered into. So he enters into the city at the Porta San Pietro, and he begins walking through the um, Campus Martius, the Campo Marzio now. Uh, and immediately what we see is he gets confused. So there is in the Campus Martius a uh, very old, very famous circus for uh, chariot racing that was built in the Roman Republic. This is the Circus Flaminius. Now our um, traveler walks across and he's walking basically on the main street, um, the main east-west street in the Campus Martius. And, and as he's walking across, he sees this structure that you see on this slide. Uh, it's a long racetrack. Uh, it's effectively, it is the Piazza Navona now. Um, and so it is a long um, horseshoe shaped track. It looks like it should be for chariot racing, but it's not. And it's not the Circus of Flaminius. It's actually the stadium of Domitian. And so this was built under the Emperor Domitian at the end of the first century AD. Um, and it's actually a running track, not for horses, but for people. So the Stadium of Domitian is something that you can actually visit. It's at the, um, the northern end of the Piazza Navona. You see the remains of it there. This is where our traveler thinks he's beginning his tour. Now, obviously, it's not labeled anymore. It is probably in ruins in 800. Um, it's certainly not being used for anything anymore. And this is why he makes the mistake and thinks that the uh, Stadium of Domitian is the Circus Flaminius. But... Um, how can he be confused like this? Well, if you look at this, um, you can see the Stadium of Domitian and you see the uh, the road that he's following, the Via Recta, um, it goes right by there. And then um, below that, kind of right where my head is on this slide, you see the Sir Flam, that's the actual Circus Flaminius. It's about a kilometer away from where he would pass the Stadium of Domitian, but he clearly doesn't know this. Um, and so, uh, so here's where we are actually. Right. We are not in the Circus Flaminius, which is at the bottom of that map. We're in the Stadium of Domitian, 
And there you see the Piazza Navona, um, what it looks like now. And these these buildings along the Piazza Navona follow basically the um, the layout of the, the stands that you would sit in um, when you were watching races in the Stadium of Domitian. So we can understand why one might be confused in 800 when there's no labeling. The thing is basically abandoned and is starting to fall down. You think you know what it is because you've heard of the Circus Flaminius, and so that's what he thinks he sees. But the next stop that he goes to, he does identify correctly. Um, and so the next stop is the Rotunda. Well, the Rotunda we call the Pantheon. Um, and so you can see here, uh, he comes in, he would approach the Pantheon from the north, um, and he would see the view that you see in that slide as he's coming down towards it. Uh, he would walk towards the Pantheon. He would see the um, he would see the front of it decked out like a Roman temple. Um, but the ancient site that he would visit um, is unlike the circus uh, or unlike the Stadium of Domitian, entirely intact. And so when he would walk into the Pantheon, what he would see is something that's absolutely magnificent. Uh, he would see flooring that was done by the Emperor Hadrian in the second century. Um, beautiful flooring made up of a sort of sets of composites of um, precious or semi-precious like marbles and stones. Um, and these stones are impressive because they're coming from all over the empire. So our traveler who's coming from the north of the Alps likely has never seen marbles like this before. Um, we know that some of these are drawn or some of these are taken from North Africa. Some are taken from Asia Minor. They're taken from places that are not going to be uh, importing or exporting stones to places like Germany. So our traveler will never have seen anything as spectacular as this. But then if he, up, he turns his eyes upwards, what he sees are the, um, the columns and the inlaid stones around the Pantheon's um, other levels. Uh, so, you know, at the ground level, you have these beautiful columns and stone inlays. The next level, um, you have almost sort of framed stone inlays. Again, types of stone that he will not have ever seen before. And then, of course, he looks up and he sees the famous dome and the oculus of the Pantheon. This site would be as impressive to him as it would be to somebody visiting it in the year 200. Um, and it's a site that has been preserved because in the seventh century, this was made into a church. And so unlike the Stadium of Domitian, which nobody is taking care of, the Pantheon is is um, part of the church now. It's being maintained by the church. And so all of these beautiful things that we see, he also saw because the institution um, that was protecting it and maintaining it in 800 is more or less the same institution that is protecting and maintaining it now. So he got the Pantheon right. He identified that correctly, although he uses the Christian name for it, the Rotunda, um, and not the ancient name, the Pantheon. But the next thing he gets wrong. Um, it's another one where he messes up uh, and misunderstands what ancient building he's looking at. So he walks down from the Pantheon. He's walking basically straight south from the Pantheon, probably along the, um, probably along the, well, the, the left side of the building. Um, and what he comes to next is a bath complex. Now he identifies this as the Baths of Commodus. It's definitely not the Baths of Commodus. Again, if we look at our giant map of Rome, um, you can see the, uh, if we, if we look back up to the north, you can see the Pantheon, and then below it, you see the Baths of Agrippa. The Baths of Caracalla, are so, or the Baths of Commodus are so far away from this that it would take you probably like an hour and a half or two hours to walk there. Um, they are down basically on the very far southern part of that map. We don't know exactly where, but we know that they are south of the Baths of Caracalla, and that's the last big structure that you see on the south side of that map. So, um, so these are not the Baths of Commodus that he believes he's seen. What they are, in fact, is um, the ruins of the Baths of Agrippa. And this is actually one of the coolest places that you can go to in the city of Rome now. Not because there's anything really um, to experience, you can't really go into them. But um, as you walk like a block and a half or so down from the Pantheon, if you take one of the side streets, you're walking kind of south from there um, along, you know, with the Pantheon on your right, uh, you walk a block and a half or two blocks down, 
Um, and if you just turn to your right, you walk into a street and what you see if you look up is the remains of a sort of domed structure. This is what's left of the baths of Agrippa. Um, and you can see it's surrounding this particular house right here. Uh, what did, what was left in 800? That we don't know. I mean, obviously this structure that's now been built into these houses, um, that was obviously still left. Um, there were probably other things left as well. But again, clearly the Baths of Agrippa were not labeled. Um, he was capable of reading Latin inscriptions. He was capable of finding them. Um, he copied down every one that he found. He didn't know what he saw here. He assumed they were the Baths of Commodus. We don't know why, but they very clearly were not. These were the Baths of Agrippa. Now, um, the next walk is a bit of a long walk as he goes down from the Baths of Agrippa over to um, the next stop on his tour, which is the Forum and Column of Trajan. This he identifies correctly again. Um, and this is an ancient Roman site built in the second century by the Emperor Trajan. Um, this is a view of what's left now of the Forum of Trajan. The column, of course, is intact, just as it would have been then. Um, and so here, our guy sees it, uh, identifies it, understands what he sees. Uh, and then um, the next stops are a little bit complicated. So from the, uh, the column of Trajan and the forum of Trajan, it seems that what he does is he walks around the Capitoline Hill um, and enters the Roman forum from the east side, um, just kind of at the south eastern corner of the Capitoline Hill. So the map you can see is him walking around the Capitoline Hill. Now the Capitoline Hill that we walk around, the way that we would walk around it is not how he would have walked around it. Most of the structures on the Capitoline and around the Capitoline weren't there in 800 AD. So um, the giant monument to Victor Emmanuel um, and the altar of the Patria, these uh, big white marble things that you see at the top of that map, that wasn't there in antiquity. Um, the, uh, there was also two, there were the remains of two temples, the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, whatever was left there, we don't know. Um, that's now under more or less the Capitoline Museum. And then there was a, uh, a temple um, that was on the other side of the Capitoline. Uh, and this now is under the Basilica um, Santa Maria in Arecoli. Uh, so he didn't see the capital line that we now see. But probably what he did is he walked around the base of the capital line and he entered the Roman Forum from the east. Uh, and he would have done it, he says, through the Ark of Tiberius. This is the next thing on the list after the um, the Forum of Trajan and the Columns. Now, the Ark of Tiberius is not something that we actually totally, we don't really know completely where it is. Um, it's basically completely disappeared, but I think the best guess is um, that it's this part of the Roman Forum between the Basilica Julia and um, really some of the temples, like the Temple of Saturn um, that we talked about earlier, that is right kind of in the forum at the base of the Capitoline. And so he's probably entering the forum from the east side, going through the Ark of um, the Ark of Tiberius. And then when he enters the forum, he will walk by the Basilica Julia and he'll go to what he calls the Church of St. Hadrian. So this is SCI with the line atop Hadriani. The Church of St. Hadrian is something that we know better as the Roman Senate House. So the Roman Senate House is, you know, the Church of St. Hadrian. This is where he goes to next in the Roman Forum. And when he enters into the um, Church of St. Hadrian, a.k.a. the Roman Senate House, what he's going to see is, again, something like the Pantheon, something that is, is remarkably well intact and preserves a lot of the magnificence that Roman, um, that the Roman Empire and Roman Imperial culture was able to produce. So if you look at that floor, like the Pantheon floor, this is made up of um, of stones that are very particular, um, per drawn from very particular parts of the Roman Empire. And, you know, they're put together in an artful way. This, too, would be something that um, our traveler would not have been able to see. The purple stone you see there is porphyry. Uh, and in the Roman Imperial period, this is a stone that really is only taken from one mountain in Egypt. But what we also see when we walk around the Roman Senate House now um, is we see not just the remains of the beautiful stones and column work from the Roman Empire, but we also see paintings. 
um, paintings from when this space functioned as the Christian Church of St. Hadrian. And so here again, we can walk into this space uh, and we can have an experience that is in some ways similar, not entirely similar, but in some ways similar to what this traveler would have seen. The building is intact, its roof is still there, the floor is the same as it was, and even some of the paintings he looked at um, are potentially things that we can see the remains of now. So uh, when he leaves the forum, we then are told that the traveler goes um, further to the east, stopping at, at some of the city's newer Christian monuments. So um, the first of these that he goes to is the Church of St. Kyriakos. Now this church is now lost, um, but its remains are under the Chiesa di, di Santa Maria in the Via Lata. Um, and so this is, if you're in Rome, you know, you follow Via del Corso up from um, the Piazza Venezia, you go a couple blocks up and, and you'll see this church. Uh, it's believed that what's left of St. Kyriakos is actually under the altar of this church. So you see on the map where it is, um, you see the outside of it. This is the inside. It's obviously very beautiful and elaborate. Underneath this is probably the archaeological remains of the Church of St. Kyriakos that he visited. The next church he visits, though, is still there. This is the Church of St. Agatha. Um, and it's actually a very interesting church uh, because this is founded. It's a church that's decorated by the patrician Rufinus. Um, sometime between 459 and 471 AD. Um, and Rufinus was an Arian Christian. And so the initial decoration of this church um, was done according to the aesthetic sensibilities of Arian Christians. And what our, um, what our traveler says is uh, particularly noticeable or particularly notable is a uh, beautiful painting or beautiful image um, Imagines um, Paulus uh, Maria uh, that he says was painted above the apse. Now we know of this apse. Um, we know that this, you know, that this painting was actually quite famous. But in 1589, the apse collapsed. And so if you go to um, the Church of Saint Agatha now, what you see is a floor plan that is original. The columns that you see in that church are actually the same columns that our traveler would have walked past when he went into this church in 800. But the apse is a replacement. And so that painting you see is not the painting he would see. It's a different, um, a different painting from a different moment. But the church itself is still there, and it's still something that you can visit, and you can still kind of enjoy the structure as he would have enjoyed it. Now, the next thing we visit um, are the Thermae Constantini. These are the Baths of Constantine. Uh, and these are one of the few secular monuments in the city that he identified correctly. So he obviously knew what he was looking at um, when he went to the Baths of, of Constantine. Now, the Baths of Constantine now are completely gone. Um, they now are basically underneath this, this sort of park area. But what's interesting about the Baths of Constantine is um, when they were sort of taken down, uh, a lot of really, really important and well-preserved sculpture was found. Um, and so some of the most impressive sculptures that we have from Roman antiquity actually come from the Baths of Constantine. Um, and one of them, which is a, a statue of a boxer, this um, is in the Palazzo, uh, the Palazzo Massimo by the, the train station. Um, there's another statue in there that actually has an inventory number that ties it to the Baths of Constantine. Uh, and so the Baths of Constantine are completely gone, but we have to imagine um, that what are, if our traveler was able to get into the Baths of Constantine and the art was still there, and it seems like it probably would have been, uh, the art collection that he would have seen is something that we can go and experience, although we would have to go to uh, museums as diverse as the Louvre uh, and the Palazzo de Massimo um, just to get a sense of, of what he may have seen on that site. Now, the second to last site that our traveler visits is another one that's intact. This is the Church of St. Vitalis. So you see there, um, St. Vitalis, this is the, the last line of the itinerary that you see listed on the left. Uh, so our map now shows us how you get to St. Vitalis um, from the Baths of Constantine. Uh, and you can see that it is all the way to the north. Um, and so it's a bit of a trek. It's maybe, you know, 15 or 20 minutes from the Baths of Constantine. But the building that you see now, if you go to the Church of St. Vitalis, is exactly the same building that he saw. I mean, it is, this is the building that our traveler went into um, in 800. Now, the last stop, though, 
is not there anymore. Um, this is the Church of St. Euphemia. This is a church that is completely gone. We don't actually even really know where it was. The best guess is it's a couple of blocks from um, Santa Maria Maggiore um, in, you know, in the Monte, more or less. But we don't actually know. And so the, the placement that you have here, um, Via de Santa Maria Maggiore 182, this is as close as we can get. Um, and with this, our traveler has finished the itinerary. Uh, and we have to ask, well, where does he go next? Um, I think that probably the, the best guess is he's going to leave the city either by the by the Porta Maggiore gate, um, that's the big gate that you see on the bottom, or through the Porta Tiburtina and probably will walk around the walls and, and maybe go back to the east or uh, maybe go to somewhere just to the, the um, eastern side of the city. Uh, it's hard to say. Um, but those are the two gates that are closest to where he would end up. Um, and, you know, and so I think we have here a sense of, of a tour going from the Tiber to more or less the eastern edge of the city, passing by a number of major sites. So it's interesting. I mean, it's actually a tour you can take now. But what do we get from this? Like, what do we learn from following this 8th century visitor through Rome? Well, what we see is large portions of the ancient city remained intact, but abandoned. So again, let's go back to our three temples in the Roman Forum, um, where he records the inscription. So we have the Temple of Saturn. That, um, that we can still kind of see, at least what the front of it would have looked like. The Temple of Vespasian is mostly gone. The Temple of Concord is entirely gone. He likely would have seen all three of those temples completely intact. And so for him, the Roman Forum is not kind of a wasteland with a few columns standing up. It actually is a place with intact buildings, but they are not doing anything. They're largely abandoned. They're probably decrepit. They're not being maintained. Um, this is not true of the Christian sites that he visits. So Santa Agatha, still there. St. Hadrian, still there. The Rotunda or the Pantheon, still there. St. Vitalis, still there. Um, and so what we can what we can see is parts of the ancient city remain alive. They remain open. They remain preserved, but only because the church has been involved in it. Um, and then even within the, the eighth century context, you have like St. Vitalis is, is a 300 year old church at that point. Um, St. Agatha is, you know, again, a 300 year old church at that point. These are very old structures um, and they're still being maintained. What we can also say is if we look at the rest of the itinerary, we see some really interesting things. Um, so the Church of Santa Pudencia um, that he goes to, this is a church you can still visit. The actual church is still there and the art is still there. Um, and so if you want to have the experience of this 8th century, um, early 9th century traveler, it's completely possible to follow his itineraries and go into many of the buildings that he did um, they look much like they did when he entered them. And you can see some of the very same art that he saw when he went into them as well. The picture that he gives us is the picture of a Rome in transition. This city is no longer the political capital of the empire. Um, it's not even part of what we would call the Roman Empire all at this point. You know, it's about to join Charlemagne's empire, but it, um, it, but it is very peripheral even when it does that. The remains of that imperial center are still there. They're still interesting, right? Our, our traveler is very interested in noting, hey, I saw the Circus Flaminius, even though he didn't really. Um, or, hey, I walked through the Arch of Tiberius. But those areas are interesting, but they're no longer alive. He can see them. He notes them. They're cool, but they are as relevant to his contemporary experience as they are to ours now. We, too, visit Rome and say, wow, that's really cool. Um, but it's not a place that we are interacting with those ancient monuments in a sort of active and living way anymore. And so these ancient monuments connected to the imperial center are still there and they are very well built. Um, but they are allowed to decay. Uh, we know, for example, um, the Emperor Constans II goes to Rome in the 660s and pulls the lead protection off of a lot of the roofs of these buildings. And so they sort of decay slowly um, until they collapse in a massive earthquake in 847. Um, among the structures that collapsed in that moment, the Imperial Palace apparently slid off of 
uh, the Palatine and fell into the Church of Santa Maria Antigua. Um, but the city of Rome still remains an important center. It's the most significant Christian religious center in the Western Mediterranean. And this is why those structures like um, the Church of St. Hadrian that used to be the Senate House or the Pantheon um, that becomes a, a church uh, instead of a temple. This is why those things are maintained and survive. They're still useful. They're still relevant. They're still alive. Uh, and so what we see in 800 is a Rome that is um, very much changing from the administrative center of a great empire to the religious center of an entity or a structure or a civilization um, where Rome exercises less the hard power of the Roman Empire of the classical period and more the soft power of the Catholic Church um, that will keep Rome important and influential throughout the Middle Ages. So if you are able to go to Rome and you are able to follow this itinerary, I have to say, you'll have a great time. You'll really enjoy it. Uh, and you'll get to see in a completely different way what this city was like and what this city is like now. So I hope you're able to do it.